Well, good morning. (laughs) Sounds like you guys are ready to worship. Why don't you stand to your feet if you're able, and let's sing together. Thank you. 
Join me in prayer, if you would, please. Father, as we come in your presence today, um, you are the joy giver. You are the one and true living God. There is none like you. And only you, Lord, can satisfy. Only you are the one. And all of us have those desires and those, those wants, but only you can bring satisfaction to life and peace and joy and purpose and meaning and direction. For Lord Jesus, only you are our Savior. We can't save ourselves. Forgive us for those times we think we can. But Lord, we want to trust you. And, and Lord, we want to hear from you today. So speak to our hearts through the music, through the, uh, the words that will be spoken, through, through the Bible, your inspired and errant word. And God, help us to be teachable, to truly have ears that hear what you want to say. Because Lord, we do love you. And, and we want to have our life circle around you. Not around things or all kinds of other stuff that we plug in there. But Lord, we want you to be first in our life. And so we, we make that declaration this morning as we come to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated if you would. Well, I agree. welcome you here this morning. We're certainly glad that you've come out to worship with us today. Um, just a couple of announcements I would like to kind of highlight for you if you would. Notice there it says uh, Tuesday, November 24th. Well, that'll get here quickly, okay? Um, Ernie's famous ribs and chicken Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, that uh, doesn't cost you anything to come to that, okay? You just come and be ready to have a good dinner together. Ernie takes care of that. It's his gift to us. We appreciate that so much. But the, there are some little slips that are uh, back by the offering boxes or back on the back tables, other places. If you would, you just kind of fill that out and, and place it in the uh, offering boxes. It's a good way for us to be able to collect them from you. It helps us to know about how many are going to be coming so we can be set up properly and know about you know, how much food and stuff to get. If you don't fill one of these things out and you still come, want to come, absolutely come. All right? This doesn't... Yeah, that's right. You might get <laughs> one rib or, you know, half my coleslaw, but no, you come. Um, so, you know, it's not mandatory you do this, but it helps us. So if you would, and just fill them out, put them in the offering box in the back, and, and that'll appreciate that. Now, you've got several weeks to do it, okay? So it doesn't have to be done today, but uh, that's what that information is for. Also, one I want to make mention of for you, you notice on the back, or also in your bulletin there, November 1 today, 1st through the 15th, we're doing a CAN challenge for the downtown mission, a way that we can kind of reach out to our community as well. And so what we'd like you to do when you go to Publix or whatever and get some extra cans, just bring the extra canned goods with you, and we're going to put them out here in the Welcome Center, then I'll make sure they get delivered to the... Uh, the special event there that's coming up on the 17th. But this all goes right to our inner city mission. And the mission does a wonderful job. They really do, folks, of, of helping. It's not just people that are living on the street, but it's underemployed. It's people that, you know, have lots of kids. And, you know, there are three families living in two rooms and just all kinds of ways that they can help out. So uh, this is one thing that we can do. It's a little thing, but it's something we can do. So if you would help us out with the canned goods there, you know, we don't want to just be in. The church is great in worship, and that's what we want to come to do. But then the church is scattered. It's out there, and we want to impact our community for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is a simple way that we can do that, in helping feed those that are hungry. And you might not realize how many hungry and poor folks we have in Winter Haven. And this is just kind of a little thing that we can do. Also, of course, at the mission, they... they share the gospel on a, on a daily routine there. And, and so help us out if, if you would like to. You know. So the couple items, other things are listed there. But we've come to worship today, haven't we? We're the church gathered here to worship and to honor King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Amen. And on that note, if you're able, go ahead and stand again as we continue to sing together. <laughs> Christ alone, our heart's desire. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this 
you are dismissed. I hope as we were singing that, that that was the prayer of your heart, that our eyes would be open, that we might truly uh, see Jesus today. If you take your hymnal out and turn in the back of your hymnal to a responsive reading back there, it's number 705. We want to talk today a little bit about um, following Jesus and being a disciple of him. And, and what that really means uh, in our lives. And so I want us to kind of look at the, uh, that, that theme or that idea. So let's look at that number 705. I uh, will lead the, I, I will read the light print and then together the dark. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and your body more than clothing? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, well, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. Amen. We're going to try this again, y'all, because the video from last week didn't work, but God is still moving. So I'm going to invite you to sing from your seats if you'd like, or if you want to just pray and contemplate, that's fine too. But sing with me if you will. Bow down. 
have your Bibles with you, you might want to turn over to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, that's where we're going to be hanging out today. Um, <clears throat> let me start at verse <clears throat> excuse me, 25, and I'll read that for you. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, as we come now to your holy scripture, um, I pray that um, we will have those ears to hear. And we we'll allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us. And I know it's so easy to be distracted. It's so easy um, to have our mind wander. And the enemy just wants to push us that way. Help us right now, Lord, just to bring our thoughts captive to you and to listen uh, to what you say to us, and to really focus now, Lord, and to allow uh, your spirit to speak a, a new word to us, that there would be a fresh wind that would blow through this place. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as you know, as we're doing these little lessons from Luke, we're, we're following Jesus, and, and Jesus is now on his way, as you know, to Jerusalem. That's where he's headed. But it tells us in the text here as he's going, there's a, a large crowd that's following him. All right? Um, you know, and you kind of think, well, why is there a lot of people following Jesus? Well, I think some of them are just curious. You know, they've heard about him, and hey, he's coming around. Let's, let's follow him. Let's see what's going on. Uh, some of them have heard of the healings. Some of them themselves had been healed. The blind that could see, the deaf that could hear. So all of a sudden, they're following him. Um, some, I think, just want to be around a winner. You know, they just want to hang out with him and be around Jesus. <clears throat> and so they just kind of do that. They follow him. They want to be around him. And just being around him, that's going to be great. And, and we're going to get close to the kingdom and all that. But, but you need to remember Luke chapter 13. We looked at last week, uh, 26 and 27, or a couple weeks ago. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. So it's not just good enough to hang out with him. But that's what the crowd's doing. There's a big crowd. They're hanging out with Jesus. And Jesus is concerned because he wants to see what's going on in their heart. It's not just about getting a crowd. He wants to know what's going on in their hearts. And, you know, he still wants to know what's going on in your heart today. Not just that crowd. And he wants them to understand, and I think he wants us to understand the same thing, the repercussions of following him. What does that really mean? So he gives us some lessons on the formation of disciples. What does it mean to really be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so this crowd's there, and he's thinking, mm, I'm not so sure they know the cost of discipleship. And so I want to tell them some things. And so that's what he does. He explains some things. He tells them a few things here. And he says, listen, if you're going to really follow me, if you're going to be mine, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, there are some things in your life that will change, and they will center around priorities. That's where it's going to be centered around priorities. So if you're filling out the little blanks there in your your paper in front of you. Uh, number one is the priority in relationships. <clears throat> Fill in the blank. Relationships. We go back to verse 26 of our text. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers, sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> now when you read that, at first you get a little concerned. Don't you have a little problem with the word hate? You know, um, I Growing up as a kid, we weren't supposed to say that in our family. You know, I hate you, you know, to your brother or sister or whatever. I mean, that was kind of, we weren't supposed to say it. Well, here we've got to look at them. What's the text saying? It's not really this bad feeling towards a family member. It's not, I hate you, you know, and this, this angst, this, this, this feeling of, you know, anger and, and hatred. That's not what he's talking about. In fact, is I would say many scriptures tell us that we're to love our spouse. We're to love our children. We're to love our parents. So what he's talking about is really a matter of priorities. It's not about emotion. And what we hear a lot of times when we hear hate, it's, it's, it's filled with emotion. It's not here. It's really about priorities. You remember back in the book of Genesis, Esau. Now Esau, it says, despised his birthright when he chooses a bowl of soup instead. You remember that? He despised his birthright. He hated his birthright. Well, he's not emotionally mad at his birthright. In fact, as later on, if you recall, he really fights hard to get that birthright back. So he's not mad at it. It was a priority. And at that time in his life, he counted soup more important than his birthright. Again, in Genesis chapter 29, you remember Jacob. Jacob has two wives. And the Bible says he loved Rachel and hated her sister Leah. Loved Rachel, hated Leah. Simply means that he chose to favor Rachel over Leah. It was an idea of priorities. It wasn't, oh, I hate her. That's not it. It was Rachel. That's my wife. That's the number one priority. So when he talks about hatred here, it's not emotional. In fact, as it was interesting, I was reading Chuck Swindoll on this little part about Jacob. And he said, 
Jacob was not too repulsed by Leah. He did, after all, conceive seven children with her. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes on and he says, the issue is priority, irrespective of your feelings. So what Jesus is saying is there is one relationship to which you must have ultimate allegiance to. That's, that's what he's saying. One relationship. And that's not your wife or your children or your friends or your parents, but it's got to be your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's got to be number one priority. So that's what he's talking about here. Um, you value the Lord more than your spouse, more than your children, more than your grandchildren, more than anyone else. Christ has to come first. So when he tells this crowd that, about that time, I think a few of them drift off. You know, oh, I don't think I'm going to sign up for that. You know, and they kind of start to back out. You remember in your Sunday school days, or remember the story when Jesus was 12 years old? You know, we kind of remember that story, don't we? You know, mom and dad, they've been to Jerusalem, they're on the caravan, they're going home, and all of a sudden, hey, you got Jesus, don't you? No, you, oh, you thought, you know, well, where is he? And, and, you know, the panic, there must have been a bit of panic, don't you think? Because they're on a day's journey, they're out there, they've gone away, and there's no Jesus. So we got to go back to town. So they go back to town and they start searching for him. And they find him there, remember, in the synagogue, a teaching, really. I mean, he's 12 years old, you know, confounding the wisdom of those. And what does he say? He says, I must be about my father's business. And he's not talking about Joe's, his dad. He's talking about his heavenly father, right? I've got to be about my father's. That's my priority over my earthly father, my heavenly father. Marcia, when she was in college, um, now, you probably don't know this about Marcia. Um, I might not tell it either, <laughs> some of it. <laughs> you know, the old happy wife, happy life kind of thing. <laughs> Maybe it'll be. Marcia is competitive. Um, and in... Some, in anything, in, in, or not so much as she was, but pretty much. Um, so she was competitive in grades, and so she always got straight A's. I, I, didn't, I didn't really care, but she always, that was a big deal to her, got to have straight A's. And it paid off because she got a full uh, academic scholarship to college. And so that was great. So she's in college, but it didn't pay for a room and board and books and a lot of other things that you would do. So her father paid for that. Middle of her sophomore year, her dad talks to her and says, um, you know that boy you date? Talking about me. Uh, off and on, or however he phrased it. You know, you know that hot shot? You know, that was his thing. Um, are you going to marry him? Now, this is the middle of a sophomore year in college. I had never thought about marriage. I couldn't even spell it. Um, Still can't, you know. Begins with an M, that's good enough. Um, so I, that, that was never, in, hadn't gotten under my radar screen. And, and Marsha hadn't thought much about it either. So it was kind of, you know, iffy, iffy, I don't know. So her dad says, if you marry him, I'm going to cut you off right now. So promise me you will not marry him. And I'll pay the rest of these bills. Now, Marsha at that time, like I said, no, 50-50. Who knows if we will or not? Maybe, but maybe not. But she felt that I can't say for sure I won't, and then I do. That would bring disrespect to my father, my heavenly father. I would dishonor God. I would break my promise to my father, my earthly father. And so she said to her dad, Dad, I don't know, maybe Maybe not. I really don't know. And he said, okay. And he cut her off that day. And he never would pay another bill. She followed the Lord alone. But her heavenly father was more important. Not to disrespect her, her dad, her earthly dad. 
but she couldn't say for sure what, how that was going to go. And she made a commitment to follow her Heavenly Father first. You see, our number one allegiance must be to God. Even, <clears throat> the text says, even willing to deny yourself. Now that's easy sitting in this room, but that can be tough sometimes out there. Luke chapter 18, verse 29 and 30 says this, I tell you the truth. Jesus said to them, no one who has left home for wife, or brothers, or parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. He said, you follow me this way, you're going to get rewarded for it. Now, sometimes it works out. It worked out good for her here. Sometimes it doesn't. You make those, those stands, and it doesn't seem like it's working out. But God says, I got you anyway. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. And that's true. And I think everybody in here would probably say, yeah, I believe that. Then why is it that we get so caught up in our earthly relationships here that it kind of messes up our loyalty to Christ at times? You know, why is that that... Um, we don't follow through sometimes. So you feel um, that the Holy Spirit, you feel God is leading you to give X amount of dollars to a special project or to a special um, occasion or a special offering of some kind. And so you do that and you start to think about that and you say something to your spouse and you say, I think God would like us to give this much. And the spouse looks at you and says, are you crazy? We can't do that. We can't give that kind of a money. And you think, wow. Mm. And you feel a little frustrated maybe. And you think, well, you know what? God, I live with this person. <laughs> you know, so I think maybe I'm going to go that direction because God, I know I, I'll see you down the road sometime. But right now, God, your approval seems to be a bit of a distance while my spouse or my boss or my parents, or my children maybe seem close. And so we do that, and we give in. I think another reason we let relationships threaten our loyalty to Christ is that somehow we think our family, or our job, or our ministry is ultimate. That is the ultimate. That is our security. That is who we are. That is where we're found, and that's not true. It is not. Christ is to be the center of our life. Our life then is to circle around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're not careful, we put other good things in that center instead of Christ. One of my favorite professors I had in, uh, in seminary was uh, Dr. Victor Matthews. Dr. Matthews was a, a great theologian. But not only that, he was very practical, just very practical and very straightforward kind of guy. And I, I really learned a lot from him. And he used to talk about how Christianity revolves around the personal work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything circles around that. To balance your life, everything needs to flow around him. So it's not about the church. It's about Jesus, who is the head of the church, you see. We, we love the Bible, the written word, but we don't worship the written word. We worship Jesus, who is the living word. You see how that works? Our life doesn't center or focus around Christian service. Now, I want you to go buy those cans and bring them. That's part of a Christian service. We ought to be doing things for the Lord in service, but it doesn't circle. Uh, it's not the focus around the, the service. It's around the Lord Jesus, who is the Lord of the harvest. You see how that works? It's not just us sharing. It's about Christ. It's always about Him. Sometimes people get hung up on their Christian experience. I've had this experience, or I've had that experience. I had this vision, or that dream, or whatever it might be. And that's fine, except we worship Jesus. He is our sanctification, not our experience. So you see how it all goes around Him. And as we grow as a Christian... We will sense the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives and how he directs us, and then he will help us to keep our life in balance. 
balancing our family life, our jobs, our church, our ministry, our playtime, our fun time, all of it, you see. And, and here's the deal. That's a little bit risky because we're being led by the Holy Spirit. So we say, God, in this situation, help me to know what to say, how to handle this. You see, we'd much rather have a, a, a list that we could check off. We'll do these five things and don't do these five things and you're super Christian. You know, because it's so easy to do that. Well, I don't do this, this, and this. No, I'm really great. But the Christian life is being led by the Spirit of God. It's being filled by Him, which means being controlled by Him. And so you're, you're tuned in and say, God, help me navigate this. You know, how, how do I answer this? Bro? How, how do I, how do, what direction? So how do I do that? Well, I, I, I get into the Word scriptures, spend time in prayer, fellowship with other believers, that's really important, be open and honest and, and, and quiet before the Lord, and, and you, you pray and you ask him, God, where do you want me to put the emphasis now? You know, where, where do you want me to, to grow in this area? You know, and it changes. It changes all the time. And, and you see, that's it, because we, are never, we never completely arrive as disciples. We're always on the road until we get to heaven. So it's this whole growth idea of following the leading of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. As God teaches and directs our lives, it's not just being so rigid that I click off these tick boxes. It's being in tune with God. What do you want to do in my life in this area, that area? God, how can I be that better grandparent? How do I handle this situation? God, how can I? You, you see, it, it's, that's how God leads us. So it's really important that he talks about here our priority and relationships. Relationship to him and to others, right? It's got to be Christ first. And it may cost you. It really might. That's okay. Because God will reward you. He'll take care of you. But you got, it's putting him first above everyone else. Second priority is that of responsibilities. So fill that one in. Priority in responsibilities. Let me go back to verse 27. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Pretty straightforward, huh? Cannot be my disciple. Now, remember, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. What's waiting for him in Jerusalem? The cross, right? It's, this is towards the end of his life. So he's moving towards Jerusalem, and he's headed toward the cross, the crucifixion. John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus' mission, his main mission, was to go to the cross to die for you and I, to take our sin upon himself, to be our substitute, to die, death, burial, resurrection. Okay, so that's where he's headed. Now, all of us as believers have a mission to carry out. All of us have a responsibility. Um, that's our cross in a sense. So let me be real upfront with you. If you don't want to carry the cross, don't follow Jesus. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? If you don't want to follow the if, if you don't want to carry the cross, you, then don't follow Jesus. Now, his cross was heavy, and it was serious, and it was painful. Your cross is more your mission, your ministry. But most of us try to make that as easy as possible. Okay? We want a, a, a light, happy, clappy cross. You know, that's what we want. You know, we want that kind of a thing. Priorities. See, God, see, Jesus is an attack on God. You know, when, when I was in India, um, we always had to talk about the one true living God because they would, they would say, well, yeah, we've got these other gods, but Jesus, man, we're adding to the list. He's just a tack on. You know, we want to cover all the bases, so we'll care. Sure. No, our God's not that. Our God is the one only true living God. And when you follow Jesus, it's not a tack on. He says, you follow me. Guess what? That thins some more of the crowd out. I don't think I want to do that one either. You know, 
hate, you know, and put Jesus first always and, and never really need to be part of the kingdom and living for I think I'm going to back out. Some like to walk around moaning about carrying the cross. Oh, it's so much work. Let somebody else do it. It's a privilege to help advance the kingdom for Jesus Christ. That's a privilege that God would ask you and I to be part of that. Living our life to honor Him. Isn't that neat that God wants to use you? Right where you are. In the circle, the sphere of influence you have. He wants to use you for His kingdom. To be a difference maker. We are empowered and enabled to carry it by the Holy Spirit. And he who started a good work in you, he's going to bring it about to completion. Understand that. He will. He's going to carry the load. You just got to be willing. You just got to be following. And guess what the result is? The result is the advancement of God's kingdom and eternal reward. Right? That's it. Yeah, so be involved. Get, get connected. Get involved in ministry. Live in your life for God and His kingdom. Be difference makers. He wants to use you. Well, the third priority is, uh, deals with priority and possessions. Number three, fill that one in. Priority in possessions. We'll go back to our text for this one. And Everything you have cannot be my disciples. Now, let's clarify this a little bit. Unpack it just a tad. He's not saying you have to give up your car, you got to sell your house, you got to sell everything you have, give up everything you have, get rid of it all to follow him. In fact, we have responsibilities, don't we? Look at 1 Timothy 5.8. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So he says, he's not talking about selling everything off and doing, you know, get rid of it that way. One of the authors I was reading on this, I, I really liked the phrase he uses. And he's talking about the Greek word there that's translated for, in my text, uh, give up everything. He says, really, the, the Greek word has a, really has the idea of renounce. To him, the title deed of all we possess. Isn't that a neat term? We give him the title deed of everything we have. That's what he's saying. God, it's yours. It's yours. See if I can give you a, kind of an illustration here. It's like you're dating someone and you uh, are in love with this person. You've been dating this person now five, maybe six months. And you think... You know, you're in love with this person. And then you fall out of love with this person. And you break up. You tell them whatever you tell them. But you break up. And sometime later you see the old flame and you think, man, how could I have loved that person? <laughs> you know, wow. Follow me. Jesus is saying many people are in love with money and things. And you need to fall out of love with those things. You need to break up. And then you need to fall in love with the one who owns and we owe everything to, the Lord Jesus. So you got to break up with some of that stuff you're in love with, fall in love with Christ, and I promise you down the road, you'll say, man, how could I have been in love with that? Say, that's what he's saying. It's all a matter of priorities. It really is. And for some, money is still a hot romance. I follow Jesus until it hits my bank account. Then that gets more important than Jesus. And what Jesus is simply saying here, hold everything loosely. Don't let things get a hold of you. Hold them loosely. And then he finishes up for us here in 
verse 34, 35. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's, is it fit neither for the soil nor the manure pile? It is thrown out. The kingdom does not need useless disciples. See, salt was useless. You can't use it to preserve things, to, to, you know, to, do, to penetrate. It's not good for anything anymore. Kick it out. Throw it out. So I said, don't be half-hearted. Be a follower. And then he ends up, the last part, verse 35, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. The person with ears needs to hear the invitation that he gives. Hearing spiritual truth is your choice. It's your choice which you need to make. How does it work out this way? We choose whether to hear or not to hear the truth. Now, you can sit there and then just say, you know what, we're going to be out of here in just a few minutes. What are we doing for lunch? Or you could choose to hear what God's truth is saying. Because you've heard truth today. Now it's your choice. Jesus calls us into a relationship, not just a decision. And so many times we're always talking about, make a decision for Jesus. You know, come on down. And we're talking about it's more than just a one-time decision. It's a relationship about following Jesus Christ and connecting with him. That's what he's talking about. So fill this last one in. A relationship with Jesus on a lifetime journey of learning and following him. It's about priorities, isn't it? It's about that relationship of Christ and with others. It's about our responsibilities and our priority of following Jesus and being connected. And it's about the priority of possessions. It's okay to have things. Just hold them loosely. Don't let them get a hold of you. It's all about Christ, isn't it? Well, it's your choice now. And you can either just kind of do a half-hearted thing, and you say, that's kind of like the salt that's not worth much of anything. Or you can say, right now today, God, right now, this moment, I choose to surrender. Not just part of my life. I choose to surrender it all. Let's pray. Father, I pray if there's some here today who've never given their life to Christ, and they know about you, but they've never made that commitment, stepped accord and sword and Savior, and they want to commit themselves to following you. Others here, Lord, who have made that decision, but perhaps have drifted away a bit or just, just kind of gotten stale. It's been a real challenge for them today as they've heard your, your word, and your word is true. And, and you talk about what it means to, to be a disciple to have formation of discipleship in our life, to be growing, to be more like Christ. Well, not that we have it perfect, because it's, it's a journey. But God, you know our hearts, and that's what you were looking at with that crowd. What is their heart? And I pray that many folks here today will say, Lord, here's my heart. I surrender it to you. I follow you. Lord, I thank you for each person that's here. And I pray right now that each of us will be sensitive to those promptings of your blessed Holy Spirit, and we'll be quick to follow, and to obey. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand, please, as we get ready to sing? I'll be standing uh, here, and, and you can come to the front and, and pray, or I'll have someone pray with you, talk with you. But let's just honor the Lord today as we continue to worship Him.
already knows your heart. Just surrender and all, you know? And again, it's not perfect. And, and you know, it's a daily thing, isn't it, of surrendering? It's not a one-time deal. It's like following Jesus. It's not a one-time decision. Well, that's how you get saved. You come to know him as Savior. But then it's daily. Lord, I want to follow you. Listening to the Holy Spirit of God speaking, working through his word. How do I do how Trusting him. And what a great journey it really is. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, thank you that you're the bright morning star, that you are the light of the world. And, God, you want to use us to reflect that light, to show that light, to advance your kingdom. Lord, I pray for each person that's here today that you might use each of us this week for our good and for your glory as we live for your kingdom. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. Don't forget to mask up. Kind of watch your distance when you're leaving. Thank you.